Hello, hello, welcome to Sunday Forum here on At The Races and uh, a slightly different uh, sort of panel today, a reduced panel sadly, Paul Keeley can't be with us, he's unwell and we wish Paul all the best for a speedy recovery, so we've got two panellists joining us uh, today for a betting oriented uh, discussion, that will be our special area of focus today, plenty of racing chat as well, Kevin Blake, welcome back. Good to be back. Sticking around for the afternoon I hope as well. Absolutely. Good action yeah. to look forward to there. And Simon Clare from Labrooks Coral. Labrooks Coral. Not sticking around for the afternoon, just in for the forum. You'd be, be very welcome to, to stay and watch it with us if you want. <laughs> of course I will. I'll be watching at home. The reason we wanted to do this, the reason that we thought this might be a good idea is at the moment, you, I'm sure, are aware, uh, the British government has a, a review of various gambling matters, specifically fob tees, which has been in the news a lot. They're also looking at advertising, promotion, social responsibility, lots of other areas as well. And it seems to me it's, it, there's been over the last sort of 10 or 15 years huge changes in the industry, huge changes in the relationship between the industry and the sport, the way it's financed, the way that we uh, take levy from the sport. The technology has changed so much. It might, might be a nice time just to draw breath and see where we are and uh, where we think we might go next as well. What issues are facing punters. Before we do any of that, I wanted to know a little bit more about you both. <laughs> even, even, even though I know you both uh, reasonably well. But, but, but with, with today's topic in mind, we'll start with you, Simon. Actually, yeah. what, what first got you into this sport and into this industry? Was it betting first? Was it horses first? Was it a combination? How, yeah, was, how, how did you get... Yeah, I was a bit, mine's a betting story. Um, I grew up in South London, you know, middle class family, you know, uh, loved sport, played football, but had no interest in racing at all, no family background. My dad was a psychiatrist, which is why I'm quite used to being under the spotlight here. Um, and it was, in fact, I always remember that, you know, on Grandstand, we didn't have all the Sky channels then, it was just the, the four or three channels probably back then. Actually, it was four, I was not, not that old. Um, it's just radio, wasn't the it? The bit where Peter Sullivan <laughs> came on and called a, called a three on a race from Hayden, it was, it was the irritation before football focus. And um, at Grand National Day was the one day that I did have, we had our sweepstakes, the family embraced that. and. Uh, and that was always good fun, so I've got good memories of that. But it wasn't until a pal of mine uh, who'd left, sc uh, left school at 16 got a job at a bank, and he'd become a punter at lunchtimes with his mates. And he, when I was 18, I was the legal age, uh, he dragged me into a betting shop in Crystal Palace. And at that stage, for those who are not old enough to remember this, you couldn't see inside a betting shop. So until you walked through the door of a British betting shop in the, in the late 80s, you didn't know what was inside. It was a mystery. Yes. You know, even if they opened the doors, you had to have the beads down to keep yeah, the... Yeah, that's right. It was a legal requirement that you couldn't oh, see. Oh, it had to be yeah. a miserable... Yeah. They were miserable places. They were smoke-filled dens of iniquity. But it was magical. You know, I walked in and my pal rushed around. There's newspapers everywhere. There was no SIS, no pictures, believe it or not. This is when it was all audio, but for TV various, TV racing. And I remember he backed horse called One for the Pot, trained by Jimmy Fitzgerald, with dogs. And he won a few quid. He but turned two quid into about 70. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. It just changed. And from then on, I became a betty shops on Saturday. I'm glad you got to the appeal of it, because so far it sounds like a really horrible experience going <laughs> well, into this place. But, but this is the point. I think, you know, I do, I do, when, I do think when you, when you find people who, who are punters versus those who've got no interest, it's almost that thing, isn't it? That little moment, that thing which made, God, there's something brilliant about this. You know? and, and it's a different world that you've oh, entered into and become totally. a part of. And it was all horse racing. So when now you've got the appeal of football betting or sports betting or betting play or anything, yeah. you know, we could bet on dogs and horses then. So, of course, it was natural that because I thought the throw of the bet was fun, you could use minimum treble on football. There was still football business on coupons, but on the whole, it was all horses. Uh, Desert Orchid was in his pomp, went to the King George that Christmas. That was my first racing experience. Pipe Scooter more in the ascendancy, loved that pair. And I say, it's funny, you know, we'll all have these memories. My memories of those, that first year of gambling and horses is fresher now than last year was. Do you mm. know what I mean? I can remember all the, all the winners of that first Channel Festival. I can't, you know, I couldn't possibly do that in the 20, 30 years since. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I loved it, you know. You it, got, it the, bug. got you, the bug. Got the bug from then on. It's interesting, though, that racing was. 90% of, yeah. of, of betting turnover in those days. If you were coming to it now, do you think, as an 18-year-old? I think it'd be a different story. I do. I think that's part of the challenges. I think, I think you know, it's a high probability football might be the, the thing, you know, that you, mm. you decide to start to have you a weekend playing football, acre. watching football. Yeah, and you have yeah, your acre okay. on the footy, yeah. and, you know, you know clearly that's there's football yeah. advertising. And that's one of the key changes. I think it's one of the challenges. Yeah. I think it's one of the huge challenges racing faces now that it probably didn't do in the 90s. OK. Mm. Kevin Blake, breeder, entrepreneur, punter, mm. author of the book, that it can be done as a, as, a, as a winning punter, but also pundit, presenter, and all the rest of it. How did you first get the bug? Was it, was it horses that, that hooked you? Was it the betting side? What was the, what was the angle for a you? A little bit of both at the same time. I, I have no background in racing. I'm from a farming family. And uh, for some reason that, that he still can't really explain to this day, my, my father went out and paid a couple of hundred quid for a, for a broodmare, knowing nothing about it. And um, 
that sort of piqued my interest because I was surrounded by it. You know, Bally Doyle is only 15 minutes down the road and Tommy Stack's five minutes down the road and so on and so forth. But I, I, it had largely passed me by up until my mid-teens and that piqued a bit of an interest. And once I started to be aware of it, the betting side of things, much like it does for, much of, for, for many of us, the notion that you can win a few quid by, by you know, backing your opinion on a, on a sporting contest is quite an appealing thing and it just snowballed from there really and I've got the type of mind that when I when I get into something I've become quite obsessed, obsessed, <laughs> obs obsessed yeah. with it. We can say that, and, we can uh, say that. Absolutely. 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 And, and we know what racing is like, racing is just such a, yeah. such a deep ocean that once you, once you dive in mm. you can get down pretty deep. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of your betting now Kevin, is it, is it all racing? Do you ever bet on anything else? Pretty much no, no. I'll have a fun bet in the Super Bowl once a year and that's mm. pretty much my only non-racing bet. Is that the only time you allow yourself fun from a betting point of view? The Super Bowl and the Grand National. Yeah. That's it. They're, they're, that's the only what I describe as fun bets I'd have in the year and that, that's become something of a, of a tradition for me now as sad as that sounds. <laughs> okay. Okay. My, my background very very similar to both, both, both of you in a way. I grew up down the road from Lambourne actually so horsing and I, I used to ride a bit as a kid and so horse racing was Did around you? and was, it, was in the locale and then when I went away and became a student I, I started to, to discover betting shops, and I loved betting yeah, shops. Yeah. I loved the, the, the small sort of social environment, and there was all kinds of people came together, and we were all equal. We were, yeah. all, we were all in the same boat, and, and, uh, and you were part of that club. And then you, you, you find a winner or two, and you think, this is, this is amazing. <laughs> that this was helpful. This, this is amazing, easy. Amazing, <laughs> amazing game. And went on to bet quite a lot. I bet much smaller now than I ever used to. Mm. Um, and, and, and that's my background. The other thing that you should know, if you don't know, I, is, is I'm an, uh, a panelist and an adjudicator for, for IBAS, which is an alternative dispute resolution body. All industries have them. IBAS is the biggest one for the, the betting industry. Not the only one, but probably the best known. Yeah. And so I adjudicate on betting disputes. We might come back to that. We may well disputes and betting? No, surely not. Well, <laughs> it's an age-old issue. Uh, it's an interesting thing that, to touch on there, because many people don't know that for years and years and years, betting disputes were not solvable that's right there's no law. legal there's no legal basis. Had no legal yeah. gentlemen's so agreement yeah it wasn't a contract yeah. but that's changed which worked both ways of course because that, that oh, also so meant that when when punters didn't pay their bills there's yes. actually nothing about couldn't chase them up yeah. absolutely. So absolutely. Was, absolutely but that's not the case anymore yeah, it's much better and, and, and a bet mm. is a contract of sorts mm. you know and and you are protected by all the consumer rights and consumer laws that apply so they have to be fair and transparent they have to be clear with you. They have mm. to be straight with you. And uh, if you've got issues with any of that, drop us an email or a tweet. Studio at attheraces.com is the email address. And we are at at the races on Twitter. Uh, the email's already starting to come through, John. Blaming race courses. Only interested if you want to drink gallons of beer and chuck your money away. And, and uh, being limited in terms of the bets he could place. That's a topic we are definitely going to come to uh, before too long. Before we get stuck into the betting world though, we must reflect on a couple of big racing stories and Joseph O'Brien, I was going to say your man Joseph O'Brien because you're work, part of the team effectively for, for Joseph, are you? Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's a big week. Doing what, helping to place horses and <laughs> yeah, crunch the form and all, all that sorts of things, different types of research but essentially programming and um, putting, acquire, accumulating all the evidence to, to put in front of Joseph to make the decision making process a bit smoother. Were you behind smoother. sending rekindling to Melbourne? Please say yes. <laughs> I'm afraid that, that it was very much driven by Lloyd and Nick Williams. Yeah. They, for well, obvious reasons. Got, yeah, that, yeah. That's a race they're, they're very keen on. This horse ha had the right type of profile. The concern was, I suppose the concern was, would this come one year too soon? You know, he's had a busy three year old campaign um, on the go since April. And um, what a beautiful run through the race this horse got. And the, like the Melbourne Cup is, is so, so competitive. It, it is such a hard race to win. And you need so much luck, because as we see here, 10 wide around the bend. And this was a comparatively well-run Melbourne Cup. They <laughs> often go much steadier than this. And you get even more compression and trouble in running. And Rekindling just got a dream passage. Yeah. It could not have went smoother. And as you'll see, he, despite everything going right, he still only wins the neck. I, I thought a snug neck, but he still needed all of those two miles to, to get up. Fabulous ride by Corey Brown and a fabulous achievement, not just for Joseph and his team, but for, for Irish racing, the 1-2-3, one, two, three. One, two, three, um, yeah. for, for, for European breeding, you know, this is, it was a, a huge result, it's, it's a very important race in the Melbourne Cup, and that to get a result like that is a, is a great advertisement for, for Joseph, for Irish racing, Irish breeding, and everything else, fabulous. Yeah, was well, indeed, tell me you backed it. Absolutely not, <laughs> no. and honestly I didn't, I, would, I wouldn't have a bet in the Melbourne Cup. So people asked me during the week, uh, you know, oh, sh should I back rekindling? And, and my reply was always the same. The Melbourne Cup is the flat equivalent of the Ancient Grand National. It is, no matter how 
what kind of, if, no matter how right you think your horse's profile is, it's just impossible to be confident. Because mm. you go through that field and watch back the run, every single horse got through the race, you'll find 20 of them that just things went wrong. And they just didn't have a fair chance to show their, the best of their ability. As it happened, it went perfectly for a kindling and he got the job done. And uh, it's a day that I think anyone associated with the horse will, will never ever forget. It was very special. Okay. So if, you, if you're swerving the Melbourne Cup, wh wh where is your focus these days? What, 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 what's your preferred sort of angle or, or type of bet? Well, for many years, it's Irish racing, Irish flat racing, and generally handicaps, generally low-class handicaps. I feel that the, my approach to betting and, and racing is the more difficult it is, the more keen I am to focus in on it, because the, 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 the greater the likelihood is that there'll be errors made in pricing, and that I can find an edge in that, and that's been my focus for, for many, many years now. Mm. Interesting. And in terms of... Um platforms how do, how do you bet these days are you an exchange player or are you a fixed odds player I, I would imagine if you're price orientated you must be more a fixed odds player yeah fixed odds um, as we'll get on to later on you know I, I haven't had a bet in my own name for quite a few years now because it's impossible to um, and I have a, a pal who has bodies in offices that, that can get a few quid on at 11 a.m. onwards when the when the the, the bet limits that the bookmakers are willing to lay rise a little bit as you get closer later on in the morning mm. and that's, uh, that's when I can get a few quid on. Unfortunately, the way things are gone with early pricing and all that, um, often a horse that might have been 16 to 1 that was interested in the night before might only be 10 to 1, sometimes quite a bit shorter. So you, you, sometimes you feel like you're, you're playing with scraps. but. That's, that's the way this game has gone, and that's, we'll, we'll be discussing the reasons why. In it's the another area of change, though, isn't it? Uh, uh, we've got a running order, but we, we may or may not be able to stick to it, because that's a really interesting point, and that's something that immediately piques my interest, because I think, well, that didn't used to happen because nobody used to price up a low-grade right. handicap. Mm. The day that's before. right, that's right. I mean, I think, you know, I think we'll talk, we will probably come to it, but I think the game has changed. I mean, it's, you see how incredibly competitive it is with all the bookmakers fighting for business in this country. Um, extra play, I mean, look at the extra place terms you now get online, for example. It's just extraordinary mm. versus what you got 20 years ago. You, would, you wouldn't get any extra place terms, you know, um, pre-internet. Uh, the information available to punters, you know, I mean, you, you know, the, what you're describing is a very professional approach to betting, which is fine, you mm. know, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's commendable because it takes a lot of effort. And actually, even going back 20 years, pre-internet, those that were, far few people got restricted because far few, few people could spot the opportunity. But those people did get restricted mm. and their battle then having found a way to make money, which was tough was then to get the money on because yeah. bookmakers naturally are going to uh, spot that, react that. Unless they're going to use that person as a guide, mm. on the whole they're going to then start saying, sorry, you're either too what, hot to What, what happened then, Simon, to change that? Because back in the day, bookmakers would price up two, three, four <laughs> really competitive mm. handicaps, either early yeah. in the morning or the day before. And the reason, presumably, that you do that as bookmakers is because you're confident about those races. Yeah. You feel secure in your judgment. You, you, you know what level of turnover you're going to get. If you're pricing up everything, you know, class six, selling races and handicaps yes. and all the rest of it and 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 you're pricing up 30 or 40 of them a day well, all of them, yeah. you can't possibly have the knowledge to trade them so why do it well i mean i think this is again we were probably jumping to a comment the 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 scale of the business such now and i think that's where um, you know we need to recognize that there is a huge uh, betting business on horse racing in Britain. There's 4.6 million billion, sorry, 4.6 billion betting shops on UK horse racing. On, on, uh, there's 5.4 billion bets online. The average stakes are tenner. So if you go after that huge, huge swathe of people who bet every day on racing or bet on Saturdays or bet on festivals, often bet on the shows, bet you know in the half hour before the race, to go after them, you know, the recreational punter. You know, you're, you're, but, but there's more and more bookmakers offering reasons to bet with them, fighting for that for that for that business. So clearly, any bit. So we're affected. Anybody who then takes a far more selective, focused approach on gambling in this country, it's much easier to be profitable. It's much easier to make money. Where once it was a tough thing to be, suddenly loads of people. Those are different types of funds being restricted. But and so of course you create it with the, the environment in, in British in the British betting business now is such that. It's servicing a huge need of the fun punter to have a bet, bet on his, you know, on horse racing. But it is opening up the opportunity for people to make a profit out of it. And then bookmakers are effectively closing in on that and, and shutting that down. So you're, so you're, you see what I mean? So you are also created an environment where it's leading you're, you're, you're saying you price all these up because you have to. Yeah. Because we, everyone else does. But the, the, the flip side to that, Kevin, is it, I mean, on the face of it, that's great, isn't it? We all get a chance to, to scour yeah. these markets 24 hours in advance. But the reality is, because bookmakers are vulnerable on those markets, you can't get a bet on. So it's worse in a way, 
where we are now than in the old, old days, is that That's right? Well, look, one thing I don't think anyone would dispute is there's never been a better time to be a punter. That's I right. think that, that, that it's so competitive that it, it's never been better. Never. never. But it's never been better to be a, a very small staking recreational punter. It's never been easier to win, I agree. Mm. Um, but there's consequences for that. And that we'll talk about. And the overall, the, the overall problem that we have is, like you say, back in the day, it was only a very, very, very small number of winning punters that were getting restricted. Whereas now, the, on, the, the, the rise of odds comparison websites and, and so on have made people so much, and there's just so much more information out there with the, with, the, with, the, with the internet, betting exchanges. Mm -hmm. people, people are more aware now of how Right. They might go about betting profitably. That information is out there, and that has led to people betting in a, in a manner that, that you would identify as a bookmaker, that your algorithms would identify as being likely to be a profitable punter. Yeah. And that is why restrictions have become such a bigger thing. I think we all understand that. Yeah. But my argument would be that while there's more information out there, and while the punters have more tools at their disposal to be profitable, I think that the the the, the the core reality that the vast, vast majority of people that have a bet will lose in the long term remains. And I think that one of the core problems of what we'll talk about at length, I'm sure, the restrictions, is that bookmakers nowadays are making, and many of them pride themselves on it, are making very fast judgments on a, a punter's behavior. You know, uh, algorithms that after four or five bets, they'll flag an account and get it knocked. My view is that not only is this very discouraging and frustrating for, you know, whatever about me. I, none, none, none of what we talk about today will relate to me or my like or b big staking punters that, that aim to win quite a few quid in a year. None of this relates to us. We, the likes that we will always struggle, mm. and, and my like will always struggle, and that's fine. Is well, that fine? I think it's fine for me. Yeah. I understand. I understand, and I know that I'll have to go to extra lengths to, to get a few to quid on. That's fine for me, and I'm let's, sure it's fine for everyone else. Let's pause, because we've got plenty of time, <laughs> we, and we are going to get through these yeah, details. But this is a really interesting it point. Is, yeah. This is, this, this is a, a, a fundamental issue here. You're saying that I accept that if I'm going to be winning from you long term, you're going to try and stop me, and I accept that. Is, is that? Yeah. My concern about all, this whole issue. I know, we'll come is, back to that, we'll come back. But do you accept that principle, that there oh are yeah. situations it's, where it's, it's always, are allowed to? It's, it's always been like that. You know, it's, I don't Does have it make a, it all right? I, I don't have a divine right to, to, to go in and win money every year. I think of what, I, what I'd like to think is if I'm going in and betting in a very fair way, which, which I think I do, yeah. I'm betting at, at 11 o'clock in the morning, often win only on handicaps where the form is there for everyone to see. I'm betting my opinion. I'm not betting based on inside information. I would like to think that I would get a fair crack, yeah. but, but I don't, yeah. generally. You know, I have to go to, to greater lengths to, to get a bet on. Um, but I'd like to think I get a fair crack betting in that manner, but I don't. But again, and just I, I've got slight, slightly sidetracked there, my main concern with the restriction, um, th with, th with this whole argument, is that casual, more recreational punters are getting caught in the crossfire here of bookmakers trying to clamp down, not just on winners, but on what we'll talk about it later, arbors and line trackers and so on and so forth. And I just feel that if the bookmakers took a more, a less aggressive approach to restrictions, it would actually be to their benefit in the long term. Because I think it's, a, like we say, we have all the information. Every punter, beginners even, have all the information at, at their fingertips. They have the odds comparison sites. They can try and get best price every time. But they're still human beings. And human beings will always be vulnerable to losing the head when things go wrong. You know, it's, it's very easy for anyone to have 5, 10, 15 bets that fit the mold of what we should be doing to bet profitably. But then they have five or six losers in a row, then they have 10 losers in a row, and all of a sudden the head's gone and they're, they're betting on everything. And that's, that's been a, a core fundamental principle of bookmaking since, since the beginning of time. It has. And, are you cutting your I nose off gone to spite your face? You, 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 no, I don't think we are. And I, think, I do think there's, there's, big, there's big variations in the type of customers who are being restricted versus some of those you're describing there. I mean, there's a key, ever since the internet came in and then the exchanges came in, uh, and then, of course, explosion of information, whether it's odds comparison sites, and of course, the explosion in the number of betting opportunities mm. across all sports, football, as well as horse racing, the overnight pricing. There is now the phenomenon, which is, it's been around for a while, and which was lazily called Arbors, because once people used to arbitrage, they would, they would see a price going on the exchange, they would take the bigger price of the Footstuds bookmaker, and then they could lay it back on the exchange. Mm. 
I don't think the liquidity is less on bet for now, so it's much more of a price guide. So we, I think to call it, we call it at Coral Labs, Coral Line Tracking, mm -hmm. where across, and it's not just horse racing, across everything we bet on, there, are sea, there is a sea of punters who worked out that if you just consistently, you know, take a fixed odds price that is bigger than the exchange, that you will make money. And those people, some of them are robots. There's an awful lot of people manually doing it, and th these these are people who wouldn't know what country that team plays in, what the form of that horse was. You know, they just wouldn't. You know, and that is, and that there's a sea of that, and that muddies the water because those people, any bookmaker watching now from any firm, any trader, would say th there's no, they, they aren't people we need to trade or want to trade or should trade. We're trying to provide a service out there, and if those people are literally just behaving like that, and that's where you know, bookmakers, we're good at this. We don't want to. We, if we're turning away profitable business for us. Well, we should be, you know, our traders should be sacked. You know, the, the idea that we're somehow turning away uh, turnover, which could be, you know, which could be levy contributions or paying contributions to all the media rights payers, it's just not true. You know, it's just we can spot. It, there's, we've been on thousands of things every day. If a sea of people come for one selection, which disappears, and then that same account yeah. the next day comes for another section, those those people are line tracking and they'll be closed straight away. But that does, they're not that normal. They're not, they're not casual recreational punters. You care. don't know that. We you, do because you, we can. We, our just, just because someone is taking looking to take best price or a price that's no, but moving. No, it's more than it's more than just best price or price that's moving. You know, these are these are these are these are these are specific selections. We're not seeing ten of these every few minutes. We're seeing one going bang, and it's the, and you can see the accounts and those same accounts the next day and same accounts. I've, I've no doubt that it goes on, but my point is you're getting innocent, casual recreational punters that are getting in caught the cross. in the crossfire. I, I, I don't th that, I mean, that, that, and that is an absolute right. certainty. You can't dispute that. Well, I, it I does happen. It, it, well, it, it has it, to happen. If, if it happens, if it happens, it's on a very honestly, I promise you, on a very small scale. And I would just refer back to the context. The average stake on both shops and online is ten pounds. That's the average stake. That means a hell of a lot less than ten pounds, as as well as above. Okay. Mm. There's billions of pounds bet in Britain on horse racing. Most of it, at times. A show price, half lab for the race, you know, uh, uh, you know, n n you know uh, selections which aren't top price. So this, this idea, the recreational customer base in Britain, betting and racing, is very well serviced and gets their bets on. If there are some caught in the crossfires, I admit it's 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 not it's not right, and I, you know. But I don't think it's a, a, the scale or something we should be holding up our hands about and wailing. I really don't. One, one of the but, issues you know, is it's very difficult to get a handle on the scale, isn't yeah. it? Isn't it? Well, 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 you, well, you can. You just look at the turnover things on British. I mean, that's what I, I, I know. It's yes, ridiculous. I know, Kevin's, Kevin's yeah. point is we don't know what it would be without the restrictions. Well, I, look, I, I can tell you some, some facts that I've seen from my point of view. Look, I'm, I'm not a specialist betting journalist, but I, I write about this every six months. <laughs> and every, every, once every six months, just so I'm not going on and on seeming to be but every time I write about this I track all my analytics every time I write about this it is absolutely true the roof this engages with people on a, like on a scale you would not believe you know we have the, the horse racing betters forum did, did a survey albeit I know the sample might not be necessarily reflective of the general public but just to throw some numbers at you 89% there's about a thousand respondents 89% had experienced restrictions of some sort but Kevin, Kevin, the and thousand people who are going to respond will be the very thousand people who get restrictions. What person is going to respond to a certain? I mean, that's well, a statistically ludicrous sample. Well, listen, listen. I mean, that, that that's a point well made. But in a, in a way, the second point on that graphic is more interesting, isn't it? That of those who've experienced those restrictions, sixty percent of them say it has affected or reduced their interest in racing. That's your. That's my concern. concern. But that's, that's my big concern. Been, okay, again, I'm, I mean, it's a certain you know, but but that could be because they were solely going into it with a very disciplined thing. I'm going to make let, some money let, out. Let, 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 let Kevin. But it's, that's not a crime. It's, it's not. It's, it's not. It's not a crime to win or to try and win. Ultimately, if you can't win, why would any of us bother trying to do it? The reality is, you know, I, I don't know the figures on it, but it's often bandied about the 95 percent of people that have a bet will be li will be lifetime losers. The vast majority are losing. And the whole point, the whole point of anyone having a bet is in the hope of winning. And if you, if people listening to this, you know, novice punters, newcomers are listening to this, they'll get the strong impression that right, if, if I show any signs of winning or win, I'm going to get shut down. Why would I bother? Because that's, we've all, we're all very passionate about the sport. And we all understand how complex the sport is. And the amount of time and effort you need to put in to become profitable on betting, and it's easier than it used to be, Much but easier. you still have to put in a huge amount of effort to make it long term. Yeah. It's a huge undertaking. And if a young lad came to me now, 18 would say for the sake of legality, I, 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 Which I, I you should do, I might find out. Yeah, a fellow that, that was mentally well equipped <laughs> for, for, for betting, a fellow with, with, with an analytical mind, with, 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 a, with, a, with a flair for numbers, and they came to me and said, Kevin, you, you're involved in racing, you know, I think this is something that would really suit me, you know, I think I might be able to make a go at this, do you think I should do it? 
I wouldn't be certain to say, yeah, because what, it would be difficult for me to tell that young guy, right, you're going to have to invest thousands upon thousands of hours into this pursuit to get good at it, and as soon as you turn the corner and get good, the clamps are going to come on, and you're going to find the biggest problem you're going to have is getting bets on. And ultimately, we're, we're but all... But, that, but to be fair, that has always been the case, Kevin, and you've described yourself. I mean, but, but, but the, also, the, the, tre guy, the threshold is lowered. The threshold is definitely well, lowered, That 18-year-old 18, 18 you're describing, though, is already, if you, you know, that conversation, that's a really disciplined, professional approach to gambling, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But, but that's you what know everyone the aspires to make money. And the challenge is often, once you've, once, you've, once you've worked out where consistently winning, then the battle is to get on, which you clearly are overcoming well, as well. Of course. Uh, like I say, I have no but, problem, but no, it's just the people, as we say, people are getting caught... Can, can I just ask you about another point, which I think is important to make as well? Quick one, because we, we very quickly. Right, right. Bar line trackers, which are generally just said, look, you're just following the same formula everyone is. You're not getting any better. Most bookmakers offer over ask, uh, over ask um, systems online, where you know they can still dis they can still uh, differentiate between different types of bets. If you're coming on Friday night for a race we've just priced up, you know, handicap chase at said for the next day, no market, the, the limits on those races, you know, there's a lot of races priced up Friday, are often going to be lower. So people mm -hmm. might experience some degree of restriction. They want 100 quid on, they get offered 40 or whatever it might be. And assume that they're being restricted when actually it's just the. If they come on for a race. show but price bet, you know, 50 minutes before the race, or if you want to bet on a football match, or bet, they will, the, the, the systems are there to differentiate. It's not like a restriction across the board. In fact, most restrictions are due to the time or the particular mark or the selection if it's a tipping line. So. That, that's an intelligent way to trade. You're, that's risk management, and, and most punters will not be restricted every bet. They may, be, I'm, you know, I, I bet. I almost, I know the business, so I know what I'm likely not to get a bet on something. But I also expect at other times. I know my bet is, you know, it's like ten minutes for the race. I probably will. Go, and, and most bookmakers should trade like that, and I do trade like that. Okay, we're going to leave it there for a moment because we must take a break. I want to get explore in more detail how we arrived at where we're at, and also how we might move forward uh, from where we're at as well. Back with you after this. Welcome back, welcome back. Uh, your emails and tweets are coming in, and uh, there are lots and lots. I say lots and lots, yeah, um, plenty. And the majority that I'm seeing coming through so far saying, I've been, I've been limited, or I've been restricted, or I've been closed down. And obviously, it's a bit like our survey sample. Those people are going to get, nobody's going to email in and say, I haven't. Uh, but if, <laughs> if you're in that camp, maybe you do, you do want to do that. But even just anecdotally, and a lot of this is anecdotal, one of our producers this morning, Limited by a, a, a well-known firm after after one bet, one mm. bet uh, uh, with them limited with another firm after a handful of bets, but allowed to bet by others. So there's mm. there's there's clearly some inconsistency. A well-known racing personality. I won't I won't I, I don't know whether he wants to be named or not actually, but he he, he did tweet uh, a, a very very big household name bookmaker limited him after a couple of twenty pound bets, and he, he he was he was restricted on 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 what he could do. They happen to be Hugh's tips, Hugh Taylor's tips, which 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 would have shortened. But you know, he's a the point he's making is a, a classic a recreational uh, cut. Before we go any further, actually, let's define recreation. You've used the term a few times, a recreational customer. You want recreational I don't know, customer. Is that not just an, another word for losing? No, it's not. I think it's, I think it's some, you know, I think again, these, there is no definition to it. These are terms just used. I suppose what you're saying is a person who seems to bet with a, you know, a, a variety of bets, uh, quite original, you know, no pattern. Not price, could, not price sensitive. Well, not always. I mean, of course, you're going to, but it just generally, sometimes you might be, but sometimes not. You know, it has fun bets. It, it, you know, uh, generally, most punters will be quite original because there's so many betting opportunities out there. There shouldn't be a, there shouldn't really be a trend of the same people backing the same things. And where there are, that tends to suggest there's a, a similar formula or similar, okay. and it could be a tip line. Look, I mean, in that race where there was a tip line, that horse would mean that people backing it, there'd be restrictions. That would, let's say it was a 60 mile race, there'd be 15 other horses in that race where there wouldn't be the same restrictions. So, well, so, you know, I, th th those restrictions will be done on a case, you know, a lot of those restrictions are not the person being restricted himself mm. all the time. Well, in this particular so example, it's, where, it's, where it's, the well-known person so, so, tweeted, so, mm. he can't get a bet on anything mm. anymore. Because his account has clearly been marked. Except casinos. Well, that'd be. Really, I mean, I'd, on what base after? I mean, I'd have to. I mean, to be honest, it's very difficult to talk into going to individual. I, I know, which is why I'm not naming the person and, and, but and naming the company. But it's, but that, it's that type of story that, that I hear all the time. It can all the time. These, I, I, could, I can promise this. I can promise this. I, I mean, I get contacted by this, not surprisingly, quite a lot as well. If, if, if where where somebody makes a case to me, they feel they've genuinely been wrong, wronged. I ask for that to be looked into. Sometimes uh, there are occasions it's been over. You know, there's been, but often there's a reason, and often actually it turns out that person is just following a line tracking policy. So I think you know. 
if there's someone out there who generally feels aggrieved, and they've been hard done by by Labrador's corals, I can't speak for every other bookmaker, and you know, I, they, they, you know, we would we would always look at it. Often we'd be able to explain to them. You know, I'd be quite honest about it, say, well, actually, the way you're betting, I mean, you know, we we would we were talking about sort of the way you bet. The way you bet, for all that you've taken very seriously and eventually now are struggling to get on, there's no question. But being original and taking your own approach is a very important thing here. And, you know, having an understanding of value, if there's five to one being dangled by a, by a, uh, which is out of line, there's quite a high likelihood you're going to get restricted, not get much on. But is 92 still value? Is 92 available? Is that a value price or even four? And you, you, you know, it's, 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 we, we understand uh, the environment we're operating on. I think we are going to talk about the way it's changed. But, you know, the behaviours that lead to restrictions are pretty much the same for every bookmaker. Now, we don't all get in a, get, get in a, get in a pub and agree our policies on this, so it's, it, it's, a, it's become that way for a reason. Does that make sense? I mean, it's, yeah, sort of, yeah. you know, it's, it's too, it's too, it'd be too much of a coincidence that every, and look, at, look at Auscheck, how many betting firms there are out there. Now, some are far more draconian than others. Some trading systems probably aren't as advanced as others, so maybe their restrictions are too draconian, but that it's, um, it's, They'll all zone in on those same areas where prices are out of line, where, where markets are very low knowledge. There's no knowledge of the markets like Friday nights or lower level sports. And you will trade. Welcome back. Welcome back to Sunday Forum here. We have a special betting focus on today's Sunday Forum. Uh, Simon Clare from Labrooks Coral with us and Kevin Blake of this parish as well. Uh, David has just emailed to say, what does line tracking mean? We've, we've said it a few times just very quickly. I think it's if, you, if you're basically using, um, in classic it would be exchanges, to sort of highlight prices which are overpriced with a fixed loss bookmaker. And out the of line. And, and out of line, exactly. And, mm. and because of the huge amount of betting products that, you know, betting markets that uh, bookies offer, it can happen, you know, it can actually quite happen quite a lot, particularly around markets which aren't necessarily linked to the exchanges. So if people just think, I'm going to sit there and wait for those and jump on them, and I say some line tracking is done by robots, very clever systems set up to literally just automatically. That's going to say a lot of that would be automated, wouldn't um, it? And, you know, and it's, it's, it's amazing. Let's play the question again. Why, yeah. what, what's wrong with that? Why, why do you, you know, if, if, it's if basically, you put up it's 9 to 2, why, why not lay the 9 to 2? Because for a bookmaker, that those particular, well, because those, you know, if you're if you're betting on say seventy thousand events, all those yeah, prices, yeah. that particular price is just one that has become a wrong price. It's, you know, yeah. and if, if if we linked every price to the exchange, which is that feasible, you get a you'd have price changes every few seconds. You get a disproportionate yeah. amount of business on that. And well, you get people just zoning in on it. I mean, those people are they're just zoning in on it. And I don't think anybody. I think if you know, if any any bookmaker or any tr punter wouldn't necessarily think those people have a right to, you know, they wouldn't, they don't even know what they're backing. They're just, they're just, they're just following a, a very, course, very Of course, of course. I always wonder what, what's, yeah. it's, it's like bookmakers yeah. complain about arbors all the time. And that's, it? those are, those, the, the, the arbors is a term which everyone gets very frustrated because the, the old days, an arbor was somebody who manually would go, there's big liquidity on Betfair, I'm going to back that horse at 9 to and lay it back at falls on Betfair. That opportunity actually mm. just doesn't happen. There's no need, I mean, that's the irony. Once people realise that Betfair was such a pure market, I mean, you know, that is where once you talked about in the 90s, you had to decide whether the market was wrong, almost with your skill. You know, in the, in the 90s, there was no guide. If Labrits went 6 and Coral went 5 and Hills 4, you had to decide was 6 the right price mm. or wrong, because you didn't yeah, know. Yeah. Now with Betfair, it's such a brilliantly pure market. Asian handicaps for football would be mm. the equivalent. You know it's wrong. And you certainly, over time, it will be wrong. Mm. And so you will make money. And bookmakers know you'll make money, so they just shut you down. And it's, again, is that just because you get knocked over with business for one selection and you can't oh, absolutely. Bet yeah. back up to it? Then? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. just, it's just, to be honest, it's a price with no, it's, a, it's, a, it's an overbroke price, in the purest way of looking at it, over time. And there are lots of them, but which are just zoned in on by these particular, uh, you know, customers. Okay. okay. Really mixed experience. Uh, some people, some, one person saying, I've, Never been restricted except for, except for one for, for 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 very small money. So maybe you've been caught in some kind of bit of technology that's uh, singled you out. But it's come to no the point now where we would almost be ashamed to admit that in, in a public in a public <laughs> setting. We, we spoke about this true. earlier. If you went into a pub with your mates and said, "Oh, just had three hundred quid at ten to one with, with corals there on a horse," they'd all turn around and go, "How much are you losing?" Yeah. Okay, you know? that, that just says a lot about the pubs <laughs> you drink in. <laughs> I, there, look, there are, the fact of the matter is there are there are. Thousands of people, well, millions of people who get whatever bet they want on day in, and day there's out. There's many thousands that don't. Well, but, that's a, it's a, but I do think it's a question of scale. That's, all, that's mm. what the point I'm making, really. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, any bookmaker likely to give us the information on how many accounts they restrict? Well, I mean, I, I mean, interesting, well, shops. What I mean, percentage? shops. I, I, I did this, the fix. I mean, in the shops, we take. Uh, four and a half million over-the-counter bets. Two and a, to about half of that is on racing. We get twelve thousand calls for permission to lay, which is over the sort of mm. the various limits, time of day limits, uh, into our um, better control. 
um, asking for permission to lay bets, eight, about 700, 800 will be restricted. So we're talking tiny in shops, tiny, tiny fractions. It's different. It's di very different on digital. But I mean, that's in that's in shops across 3,400 shops. So in. Digital is different because it's all an automated system. That's where all the action really is. So, and but then it's a, it's, it's harder to it's harder to measure because actually if customers are graded on their entirety at a low level, you know that's almost an automatic restriction. It's not even a, it's not even a, a judgment being made. So line trackers will all have automatic restrictions. Okay. But then you have the so. But again, I mean we we we've gone around the house on this. All I'm at pains to say really is that there is that there is a huge volume of customers, even if they might be ashamed to admit it in the pub, who get exactly what they want on when they're betting on British racing. Oh, I have no issues, sadly, at moment. <laughs> Nor do I generally. Ninety-nine percent of my betting is exchange betting. I've is that right? I adopted exchanges yeah. early and, uh, and have yeah. stayed 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 with it. So I don't experience that problem because I, I, yeah. my betting is win markets that's in horse racing. Yeah, and, and, and that's important to mention there's too. There's no issue with that. People do have that option. You're generally with, with with exchanges. If you're if you're a big punter, you're generally waiting till quite close to the off, and exactly. um, you're dealing with tighter margins mm. there because, you know, it's just tighter. It's a much more efficient yes, market at that more. time of day. Yeah. And for for many people, that that's just fine for me. It, it never quite suited me. Um, it doesn't even provide an edge. That's right. Well, the thing is, I want the big edge. I'm, work, I'm, I'm working hard at it, which is legitimate. I'm yeah. working but hard. Right. I, want, I want the biggest edge I can get. And that's. But I think this is just another very important point. This, and I think again, it's it's great to be having this debate. I just go back from America, where if you want to have a bet on horse racing, you're limited to a tote only system. Where if you mm. want to back a, have a treble, it has to be on races three, four, and five. You can't have a treble on races two, six, mm. and eight. Let alone have a bet on a horse, on a dog, or a horse. I mean, we, we are blessed in this country to have the most incredibly free, flexible mm. uh, betting system, which also is heavily regulated and licensed, as we, we, as, we as we know, and increasingly so, which is 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 more ever than more than ever taking a very socially responsible attitude to betting, which is right. And um, and you go to other countries, many of them, where there's nowhere near the same opportunities to have a, a you know okay. whether a bit of a pleasure or indeed bet seriously. And I, I, I so we, we're a victim of our own success sometimes when it comes to the this particular subject of restrictions. I just had a tweet actually from somebody been in New Zealand said, made exactly that point and said save us from a tote <laughs> monopoly where. You, you, there's no flexibility. No there's fun there's at all. There's that's no it. And some people will occasionally put up a, a tote monopoly as, as being a nirvana. It's not. It really it's isn't. Not, you know, the, we, we we want a competitive betting market, but ideally one where <laughs> where restrictions <laughs> okay, aren't well, quite Let's, as let's big talk about solutions. Uh, the lay to lose guarantee. You'd like to see that across the board. Is that is that feasible? Oh, okay. I mean, we, we had a time today. It, yeah, might be. At it would have to come at government level because I don't think, as we've seen, mm. Coral have been doing what they've been doing for three years and nobody else has jumped in. Mm. So there's clearly not a will amongst the bookmakers, despite the fact that what we've mentioned is going on in Australia, you know, statewide minimum bet guarantees in New South Wales. Different um, landscape, though, isn't it? It slightly is. Slightly different yeah. landscape. But the point I was making is that the, there's a lot of bookmakers operating down there that operate up here. And the minimum lay minimum bet guarantee has, by all accounts, worked very well down in Australia. No one is complaining about it from either side now, uh, despite initial objections. And you've got some of the big corporate bookmakers up here have operations down there, and they have no problem adhering to it down there. But so, so why can't they do it up here? They they have no problem if they were made to do it. <laughs> if you were, no if you were made to do it, what would happen? Well, Presumably, uh, overnight pricing will go overnight. Yeah, I mean, I think just first, I think I think that New South Wales thing is a fascinating uh, area. But like everything in life, but let's like say I'm going to pick that country's tax system or that health system, you have to look at the whole. And and, and in New South Wales. Indeed, Australia, the tote is incredibly strong. The tote funds racing in Australia, mm. so fixed odds bookmakers are almost after the event. Mm. Complete reverse, really, to this country. Um, I can see. I think there was a big, quite a big protectionist uh, element to that because they couldn't have fixed odds bookmakers offering better value or mm. significantly better value than the tote because it could really have hit their funding model hard. So it wasn't just about, I think, giving. It wasn't just a uh, purely a sort of customer focused. Um, Policy. They also had to hit best the betting exchanges hard. Betfair in, mm. in Australia and New South Wales hit with very high taxes, which has forced their commission rates up, their um, volume cap down. I can only presume, I'm not close enough to it. I'm guessing that the, the, the price on exchanges are sim similarly having to be compressed by the people laying. Uh, and the margins that the, the, the fixed odds bookmakers bet to clearly have to be lower. So, which is which is fine if you still if for, for the shrewder element who still can get their bets on. But this is this is the, this is the the un immeasurable. What would it do if you had that situation here? Well, the high probability is a exchanges would have to be hit just as hard as fixed odds in terms of forcing them to either lay similar levels mm. or their prices couldn't be significantly more generous because that would completely undermine the whole system. Um, 
and you would and bookmakers would probably have to reduce the you know some of the concessions they currently now offer which you might think is a good thing and bet to higher margins which again you might think I, I, I think many people in Kevin's probably would well of course they would people say who's I'd be happy to see the paying both <laughs> results and but then this is the point but this is so this is the point so you'd be changing you'd be ta places. you'd be tailoring a betting system for the few not the many oh. and would you would you then end up with uh, a, 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 a less attractive it's betting funny you system. That. I had an email earlier saying that Jeremy Corbyn should, should <laughs> thre threaten to nationalise. And again, I just, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, there, look, I mean, I'll come back to another part. I mean, there are people within bookmakers' trading departments who actually would really like to get to move to that sort of world because they'd enjoy their jobs more to some extent. But um, well, the, the, the concession culture has gone too far. It's, it's, it, it's, 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 it's gone far too far. But the, really. the, trouble, the trouble is, is that you know, you, what we do have is a fi is a, is a a very established and successful fixed odds betting business in Britain and indeed uh, you know in, in, in Gibraltar etc uh, which funds British racing to the tune not just of the levy on now both online and shops but also media rights payments in shops the streaming which comes in which is you know 30 million 40 million pounds of revenue which is never mentioned and um, not to mention all the other ways that bu bu bookmakers uh, support the, the you know whether it's through media partnerships sponsorship promotion marketing you know if if, 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 ed, if, if you brought in any kind of artificial system which damaged that for all the reasons it might it might make you know easier for, for certain punters to get bets on that would be an unhealthy well, situation. Well, damage, we don't damage know. in what regard? Define well, damage here. Lower, lower turnover? Well, could, well you, you, might, you might lower turnover, it might be lower bookmakers. I maybe. think they'd be much higher turnover. Well, I think, well, but, okay, might, might higher turnover, maybe less profitable turnover. But if bookmakers, mm, that's debatable too. Okay, well, if bookmakers made less money, that'd be less money fact going to racing. This, this, yeah. this, is, this is the crux issue. In, in Ireland, you have a mm. turnover, turnover tax. Yes, yeah. uh, and, uh, uh, yes 1%. 1 um, Betting tax and yeah. turnover. Yeah, uh, like I think the it would, it would help that. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> that might be a oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's why, not that's why I've been so, so so strong for it in Ireland as well. But like yeah. I think the gross profits model is just deeply unhealthy over here. I've never liked it. The fact that racing is essentially hoping that the bookmakers that the that punters lose. I think that's a fundamentally unhealthy it's relationship. The same. Well, that's, that's what happened. A tote system in America, in Australia, is based on the money that's kept by the tote system going to racing. It's entirely the same system. Well, it's, if any, it's essentially, if any, it's essentially a turnover with the tote. Well, because you know? it's a guaranteed take. It's a yeah, exactly. And they, they're encouraged, they're, thus they're encouraged to do everything they can to stimulate greater turnover. That's a healthy because relationship. Because they know they're going to make the money. We, we, we do everything we can to stimulate turnover that we can make a solid margin out of. That's the, you we, we could, we could stimulate profit. Yeah, well, we you know, ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, but so, so the tow system. That's exactly how tow system works. We, well, we just had a, an email saying you want the odds in your favour all the time. To which my response is. Yeah, I know. The bookmaker has to I know. win. I know. Oh yeah, well, yeah, that's that's why they're that's why they're doing it. Yeah, that's why they're doing it. Yeah. But it has to be fair as well. You know, yes. it can't be a case that you yes. only want to deal with with guys that are going to lose. No. Yeah. I think, I, I you know, know, if, if you touch if, on a really if interesting if thing, if you can't win, you can't lose. Mm. You know. and, and other other people have expressed concern about this. That horse ra the world of horse racing needs you to make as much profit as possible. So it's in their interest for you to make as much profit as pos possible. And and Kevin senses a kind of. You know, a conflict of interest there. I, I it's a very I, look. It's a difficult. You know, you, you, you're weighing up. You know, our, you know, we want to. We, we, you know, we want to lay as many people as possible. A, you know, a fair, a fair betting service. But clearly, there is. There is always going to be. We're a business. We're always looking to make sure that we're operating to, to, to the margins we need to. I had, um, I had a chat with a couple, uh, chat with a couple of bookmakers at Formula. I don't know whether we have time mm -hmm. to play. Probably, probably we don't now. Apologies to Pete and to John, who were kind enough to speak to me down at Formula the other day, who are. And I've spent, on a couple of occasions, days with on-course bookmakers, uh, seeing them work firsthand, and they're desperate to take bets. I know. They, yeah. but, but they, of course, they need a, a, a margin. They need no, won't guarantee they win. Ooh, six favourites go in, they won't win. No, that's right. Um, so th th there is no no guarantee, but there has to be a margin in the bookmakers' favour. Mm. They have to win in the long term, otherwise. There's no show. Yeah, exactly, I, and I wouldn't dispute that. But it's all about fairness and people being given a fair crack. And yeah. you know, the ultimate the ultimate line I give, I can understand why some certain people get restricted for betting in certain ways. But my ultimate point would be that it has to, that they should be given a fairer crack, a longer okay. crack at it. You know, the other thing we have, is which is kind of why, is kind of why, you know, with the guarantees in shops, and uh, it's one of the reasons we got rid of the uh, advertised pricing guarantee on Saturday mm. mornings festivals, because in many ways. 
our traders, James Knight's the head of trading at Racing, feels passionately about this. He wants the freedom to be able to, at the right times, take on favourites and mm. trade the trade punters. But and it's trade your opinion exactly. Mm. But it's 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 not easy to do, particularly when you're when the, with the concessions and the the price. Well, you know, it's a price war out there. That's yeah. the trouble. And price wars, you know, they often so, have so, some other down. topics that were <laughs> we had loads of topics to discuss. <laughs> we longer. On, we, we, we focus on, it's been really healthy though. And thank you both for, 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 for speaking so frankly on, on a topic which, which everyone's quite interested and passionate about. And it's teasing out lots of things yeah. uh, about how, how we got there. There are other issues at the moment. The government is looking at uh, FOPTI. I don't know whether you have a strong view on this. And, and what's your, there's, there's going to be a 12 week consultation period yeah. now. They are going to reduce the stakes on FOPTIs from somewhere between two and 50 quid, which is a wide range. 100 pound is the maximum at the moment. I did actually wade through the data on this. Mm. Nobody bets 100 pounds ever. No. Um, less than one tenth of one percent of sessions involve a hundred pound stake. So if it goes down to 50, it's not going to make a blind bit of difference to you and you've gotten away with it again. So that's that's what you'll be lobbying <laughs> for, presumably? Well, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm not part to, the, to our particular response to the consultation. I think, I think you know, look, this has been a long, a lot, you know, a long period of time. There's been a huge focus on this. Uh, you know, you know that the, the industry's approach has always been: look, we've got to take an evidence-based approach. To this there's a lot of emotion in it, a lot of uh, opposition in certain quarters of the media, certain quarters of, of, of government. Yet, fundamentally, that there is a lack of evidence, and certainly no evidence pointing specifically to fob teas beyond any other betting product uh, as causing more problem gambling. Problem gambling is the issue. There's a, rightly a big focus on that and what the industry is doing and what it should be doing and there's lots of measures continuing to be unveiled and uh, across the industry both online and retail which I think is incredibly healthy that you know whether it's because we're under pressure to do so or you know you're talking, courts, you're talking the talk you boys but there's some big old fines being dished out on the there are and, you know, and that's and again well you could look at both of those but that just shows you that for anyone who thinks that this isn't is, a, is an issue which is not being regulated properly it, it very well is that gambling commission has teeth a zero tolerance approach some of these things are you know the trouble is the time lag is that they're, they're, they're things which happen happened yeah. a few years ago but I mean at the same time make no mistake those are that that is why across the businesses now our business I'm sure other bookmakers you know these these are things that have got to be done right you know we have to we have to adhere to our obligations our licenses and it's right that we should do so we're dealing with a you know a thing which is a pleasure to most people but it can be a problem to some there's no question on the FOBT issue there's going to be a change right whether it's 50 30 20 or 2 uh, and, and one of the most important things we're just saying is, is, is we've got to take account of the, uh, of, you know, of the importance of the industry and make sure that the decision is linked to the evidence available. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, 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 a cut to two pounds would be devastating for betting shops, it's devastating for the horse racing industry in terms of its short term. Well, th well, forever. No, I don't, if, I don't think so. If, if, if the, the media rights payments to British racing are up to 200 million pounds a year, the levy is 100 million pounds a year. The, the media rights payments is the thing that has just changed the economics of horse racing in 15 years from being at the mercy of the bookies to now being very much in control of its own destiny. But those media rights payments are linked per shop. If the 8,800 betting shops go down materially, you are going to see a There is, there is a bit huge. of a misconception about betting shops. Because we get much more clustering than we used to, everyone assumes there's loads of there's no new more. betting yeah. shops. Actually, there's less than... Exactly, so that's, that's right. They just they just changed. They've yeah. moved on to a high street, which is seeing every. every I, I every did other read a, yeah. a, a, a newspaper article which began by saying, you know, even if they reduce the stakes, the bookmakers are still going to make lots of money, as, as if that was the issue, uh, which was which was interesting. Mm. Yeah. Okay, there is a, a, some people seem to have a moral yeah, objection I mean, to Fob, Fob, yeah, Fob, Fob, money. Fob Tees, Fob Tees came. Arrived at the perfect time, just when the internet was was arriving, online betting was flourishing, and basically the the, the move of betting. Most people, young people now, who get into betting from 18 onwards, um, are betting online on a mobile. They're not betting in shops. So your customer base in shops is aging. But Fobtees arrived at a time which almost it almost filled the void, and so now over 50 percent. Well, my, my local betting shops are largely empty. Yeah. It's, 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 which is really sad. Very, you know, very different environment. So the yeah. Yeah, people are playing the FOBTs, but all of us who are betting on horse racing, we're still betting on horse racing, but we're doing it at home. Absolutely right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we don't have FOBTs in Ireland. Never mm. had, never will. And betting shops are doing just fine. Um, and the, the thing with the FOBTs, and I, I've wrestled with FOBTs a little bit in my own mind, because in, in, in life I'd be very much pro-choice, think people should be accountable for their own decisions uh, and everything else but then you look at these machines and you look at what they do the way they're designed the way they're they hone in on certain weaknesses in people's mentalities and then you look at the way the betting shops have clustered around low-income areas to to seemingly make the best of, of, of the, the, the limit you know only four or five t mm. machines allowed in per office so they're clustering these offices in areas where there might be more vulnerable people in that neck of the woods and for me 
it, it becomes a very easy decision to be happy to see them heavily you restricted. targeting vulnerable people, are you? No, no, are you I going where the, the red is cheap? It would be very, very easy to you, interpret it that way. You I I mean, and, and it is interpreted in parts media. But, you know, we've done, or those are those are areas of high population density. You know, I mean, I mean there's a lot of chicken shops in those areas as well. Absolutely. A lot of yeah. shops and, and a lot of those, well. remember, the demand test used to be that a betting shop had to be, I think, 800 yards away from each betting shop. And weirdly enough, we actually, as a major high street operator, we, we were gutted when they changed that to say that you could actually park a booking next to each other. Because we, we had all the prime sites, and suddenly everybody was landing just, just there. Very quickly, right the, the other <laughs> accusation leveled at the bookmaking industry as a whole is that you've become so dependent on these machines mm. that you don't need to be proper bookmakers anymore. You don't need to take a bet anymore because you've got these lovely little machines which require no skill uh, to operate, and they just suck the money in. Well, I mean, I, I've heard those, and I always say, well, what does that mean? That you know, you, when you work for a, for, for directors, shareholders, they want you to optimize everything you do. They're of not going to suddenly but say to neglect. Point, if, uh, if that was taken away, it might encourage you to be more creative. Yeah, but, 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 might, but, not, but, might not be so quick to turn away business. But, but, okay, but again, I totally <laughs> dispute that. You only have to look at the innovation that's happened in fixed odds betting on the sportsbook side and racing side. Whether it's cash out, request a bet. Uh, you, I mean, w look at all the effort we're doing to try and attract new business of extra blazers, best odds guarantee, best odds guarantee plus, money back of your horse horse. There's uh, all the effort that I personally put in as a, from a PR point of view, the marketing teams put in the PR point of view, is focused on supporting Cheltenham, Grand National, World Cups. Mm. We couldn't put any more effort, I promise you, every day we're discussing how can we make more money at horse racing. Let's, you know, we, we haven't really had a chance to touch on it. Why, is, why are bookmakers doing deals with, with, with jockeys and trainers to do blogs? Or That's a very good question, by the way. The where do we, where, where yeah. do we stand on that? Because some of our viewers are a little bit concerned about that. I think you're, you're presumably well, I think you're look, as long as, you know, we, we are regulated licensed bookmakers, you know, yeah. we, we are responsible operators yeah. and, and <laughs> what <are you> <laughs> so, so, so there's nothing, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we, you know, we're doing our best to promote racing. It's of course you are, of course you are. In all, in all, often always, oh, but they do that. You're you know, building a relationship though with, with professionals who are involved in the sport and, I, and, and, and that's, there's a potential for a perceived issue. Uh, there. there is a perceived, there's also a potential for a real issue mm, as well. Yeah. If I'm a jockey and you're paying me, and I really don't like this favourite tomorrow, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just gonna say, don't put it in the column sign, obviously. Uh, he hasn't got a chance. The chance. I mean, the thing is, it's gone so far beyond that. I know there was a time, I mean, you know, I'm sure there's some people have that perception. Yeah. But the re you've seen from the gambling character, the, the upside from meddling around okay. in such okay. a silly way is okay. not, you know, okay. 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 do you know there, what I mean? There, there is a no, wider issue in this as well, mm -hmm. yeah. and that the bookmakers, uh, at, at the way the whole game is now, at the media side of things as well, is the bookmakers are essentially the best payers. They can afford to pay jockeys, trainers, Journalists, broadcasters, the, the best, the best money. That's a good it, thing. It, it, it's, it's, it can be good for their pockets, but is it is it good yeah, for well, balance and coverage of these I, issues? I, 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 we're, right, talk, well, we're talking I, I, about today. I think the blogs are. Well, I think some of the blogs. The blogs are generally well written. You know, Great British Racing can only do so much. Race courses don't promote the sport in this yeah. way. They do. They promote their show. Okay. Who's going to do it? Uh, well, well, I mean, how the race is well. Race is well, okay. Some, some, you know, some, somebody <laughs> else will do with it. I should be racing. They feel like increasing our weight. <laughs> I mean, so, so, so we're not lured off. I know. Well. I think it's all. I think it's all very healthy. Okay. There's a lot of promotion of British racing, which is great. There is a, a case for saying actually, actually the relationship does seem to be pretty healthy. We're, we're, we're very short of time. So where we are now and the, and the near future. Good, good positional. Oh, I, th I think, I think, I think we, there's an element of we are where we are because it's a, it, this is a huge beast which yeah. moves and lumbers, and we've seen the change over 20 years. I don't know, whether, you know, I think there'll be more consolidation in the sector. I think looking, I think the the foreign markets will become a focus because UK is pretty saturated. Okay, now. Kevin, one thing you could change if you could if you could wave the magic Blake wand, what would you? What would oh, it'd be the minimum bet limit, but there's yeah. there's huge issues here. It's, it's, it, I'm delighted that Simon came in that we were given the opportunity to talk about this because this is a, a, a it's, it's disgracefully undercovered issue in the racing media. The mainstream press are picking up on it more than our racing media and that perhaps that's a consequence that bookmakers um, give so much work to journalists, broadcasters and everyone else, you know, that this that we don't that we don't see this fleshed out more. You know, and if I had one wish going away from this is that this will help stimulate a wider conversation, that, that our trade paper will cover it more often than they do, that it will be discussed more regularly because bookmakers should be given their say on it the, the, the chance to explain themselves and punters yeah, the Horse Racing Betters Forum um, do doesn't get great interaction from the bookmakers and they're not, they're not being given the chance to represent the punters. And we just need to talk about this more because it, okay. uh, it is an important issue. Uh, do you know what? I feel another program coming We need a on. rematch. Another, another <laughs> we, program we can keep going. going. You, you, you're <laughs> going to go away and see if you can improve communication. With yeah, communication we, will, yeah. we will pick that up with mm. you uh, in the future and we'll see if any of those other things come to pass. We'll be interested to get more into information on, on, on some of those topics. Uh, my thanks to Kevin and to Simon. Thanks to everyone who's emailed and tweeted. There have been loads and loads of you who got in touch today with 
I've picked up, I hope, some of your themes, if not all of your individual uh, messages. Thanks for watching the Sunday Forum Race Day Live, and it's a good day of racing coming up next.